going to be talking a little bit about aphasia, and aphasia is a language problem caused by any kind of brain injury. And it's really been known since the 1800s that the left, damage to the left hemisphere can cause problems with language. And furthermore, that damage to specific parts of the left hemisphere can cause different kinds of language problems. And this uh, came, this uh, uh, conclusion uh, led to actually led to the observation that, that there were specific parts of the, the left hemisphere that were Im important or possibly even necessary for language. So the assumption was that if you produced a, a particular lesion in the left hemisphere and it consistently caused a particular deficit, so um, a lesion in the the frontal part of the left hemisphere always caused somebody not to be able to talk, then that part of the brain was really necessary for speaking. Um, but remarkably, people generally recover from aphasia. So maybe no area of the brain is truly necessary for language. Um, other parts of the brain can take over for that damaged part. And we used to t ask questions like, does the right side of the brain take over language if someone has a stroke in the left hemisphere? Or do undamaged parts of the left hemisphere take over uh, language? And people in the, um, in the 1800s and the 1900s made some important observations. They noticed that people who had very large strokes, uh, large areas of damage to the left hemisphere, had sometimes completely recovered language. So really there was nothing left of the left hemisphere. As you can see, it, this is a, a brain scan and this person's had a huge stroke in the left hemisphere. So it must be that the right hemisphere took over language. But even more importantly, if you anesthetize the right hemisphere of somebody like this who had recovered language, they then became aphasic again, suggesting that the language had crossed over to the right hemisphere. But then in the 1980s, functional imaging came along and we could look at areas that activated during, uh, during language tasks. And these studies raised all kinds of controversy because some studies showed that when people were involved in language tasks they were, and they had, uh, they had recovered from aphasia and they had had strokes, that mostly they showed right hemisphere activation during language, whereas other studies showed no, mostly they show left hemisphere activation around the stroke. And other studies showed, well, they show both left and right hemisphere activation. So there were all kinds of um, arguments about who's right. And I'm going to show that there's really no simple answer, that the brain recovers language in different ways. And it depends on the time after stroke. It de and it de depends on the location and the size of the stroke. And it depends also on individual differences between people and the task that they're performing. It also may even depend on the medications that they're taking that may affect neuroplasticity. Um, and, and maybe some other uh, individual differences, like the degree of education that they have and how expert they are in the task that they're performing. So if I show you a, uh, somebody who's involved in an fMRI task, a functional activation task like this, this, you wouldn't know what task they're performing. Because this is the left hemisphere, and you can see a lot of activation in a number of areas. This is the left inferior frontal uh, area called Broca's area, and this is an area just uh, kind of uh, above that and, and posterior to it called Broadman's area 6. And this is an area uh, in the posterior temporal cortex called Wernicke's area. These always are activated during language tasks, no matter what the language task is. This happens to be people who are uh, generating uh, verbs in response to a noun. So they're um, given a word paper, and they have to say uh, any verbs that come to mind, like fold or read or draw and so on. This, uh, this is a separate fMRI task where people are involved in another language task. And again, you see um, activation in Broca's area and Wernicke's area and this area, Robin's area six. And this is a completely different language task. This is people repeating sentences of different degrees of uh, 
um, syntax, com syntactic complexity. Um, this is a completely different language task. This is word retrieval, and again, you see activation in Broca's area and Wernicke's area and Broadman's area six. Now we see another area that's often involved in language called inferior temporal cortex, when we see uh, word retrieval involved. And this is a task where uh, word retrieval, um, naming pictures is compared to just saying one, two, and three. And here uh, we see reading uh, shown in blue and spelling shown in green and in red circles, the areas that are shared by these two tasks. But again, we see Broca's area and Wernicke's area and also this inferior temporal cortex. So these are, uh, a, we see a lot of similarity in the areas activated by a number of language tasks. So this is sometimes called the language network. So what's surprising is that even though all these different language tasks tend to activate the same areas of the brain, um, and we see this even in, in sort of passive uh, viewing tasks, like uh, passively viewing people talking or listening to people talking. Again, we see these same areas activated. So even though we always see these areas activated and they're, they're activated, uh, they're also connected by white matter tracts more in the left hemisphere than in the right hemisphere of the brain, lesions to, the, to different components of this network cause different language problems consistently. So lesions to the left inferior frontal gyrus, Broca's area, causes very different problems than a lesion to the posterior temporal cortex, say Wernicke's area. Um, and it's pretty consistent. Or a lesion to the inferior temporal cortex is gonna cause very different problems from a lesion to the superior temporal cortex. So, um, and that seems somewhat surprising at first. And so some people, and I'm not gonna talk a lot about this, but many of us, my uh, colleagues and I, um, have spent a lot of time sort of working out what these various uh, components of the language cortex uh, do in language. And uh, uh, the left hemisphere components have different roles in language than the right hemisphere components. You always see some activation in the right hemisphere during language as well, but they always work together. But what I want to talk about today is how the brain recovers or adapts to a lesion in uh, the brain. And Dorothy Sowers uh, did a study longitudinally of stroke patients and started to solve some of the mystery by showing it really depends on when you study patients um, after brain damage. So she studied a, a large group of stroke patients at various times after stroke. She lumped them all together and had them listen to um, sentences, um, some of them that made sense and some that didn't, like the pilot ate the airplane versus the pilot uh, flew the airplane. And she found that normal controls uh, show this activation of the language cortex, again, Broca's area and Wernicke's area, inferior temporal cortex, and again, this area, Broadman's area six, and a little bit of activation in the right hemisphere. Now, immediately after stroke, in the acute stroke period, most of these, on average, patients showed very little activation um, in the left hemisphere, a little bit in Broca's area, but not much activation at all. Where subacutely, in a, a month or so after stroke, they showed a normal left hemisphere activation, except of course in the stroke area, um, and she didn't talk too much about that, but they showed increased activation in the right hemisphere. So the right hemisphere was starting to compensate. Um, but in, especially in chronic stroke patients who recovered well, there was a shift back to the left hemisphere, so we actually saw a normal pattern of activation in the uh, chronic stage, so that in people who recover well, you see nearly a normal pattern of activation, very similar to what we saw in the healthy controls. So it sort of solved the problem why different investigators were seeing different patterns of uh, activation in recovered stroke patients. Maybe they were testing them at different time periods. But we hypothesized that how the brain adapts to the lesion at, um, in recovering from aphasia might not depend only on the time since stroke, but also on changes in blood flow in the brain, the size and the site of the stroke, but also on individual variables such as education and expertise, 
and depending on the language task. And since uh, you all are writers, I'm going to show you that writing is somewhat different from other tasks and may recover differently from other tasks. So we study patients um, at the very first day after stroke with structural imaging and blood flow imaging that I'll show you. We try to intervene to restore blood flow because I'm actually a stroke neurologist, so we try to make people better. Um, we test them with language testing before and after that intervention. We also test them with uh, functional imaging tasks acutely, and then we bring them back after uh, uh, two weeks or so, and then we bring them back at six months, and then we bring them back at 12 months, and we repeat all of this imaging and language testing. And what we found in, um, I'll just share with you a little bit, is that early recovery of language really depends on restoring blood flow to critical areas of the brain. So for, I told you that Wernicke's area, which is the superior temporal cortex, uh, is one of the components, one of the areas critical for language. It's particularly important for word comprehension or word meaning. This is a task of just very simple word picture matching. It does this, uh, uh, is this a picture of a horse or a picture of a cow? And this patient has low blood flow, shown in blue, compared to green, which is normal blood flow, in Wernicke's area, and is poor at this very simple word picture matching task. We were able to, and this person had a critical narrowing of the internal carotid artery here that was responsible for the poor blood flow. And we were able to uh, put a stent here and in increase the blood flow to this area, and he was able to improve in, in word comprehension. Uh, the same thing happened here. This patient had poor blood flow in Wernicke's area, shown here, and had, was at chance in this word comprehension task. When we were able to restore blood flow here, uh, medically, he was able to uh, improve in word uh, comprehension. So this shows really dramatic evidence that uh, even though this area was not damaged, it didn't show an infarct here, it showed low blood flow, that this area is critical for word comprehension because if you restore function, if you restore blood flow, it's able to, uh, then you restore the function of that area and it does improve. This patient showed a very small area of low blood flow. This is Broca's area in the inferior frontal gyrus. Um, and it's responsible, as I mentioned, for a number of uh, production uh, aspects of language, including speech articulation, producing a grammatical sentence, and also some aspects of writing and spelling. And we looked at all of these, uh, these functions when this patient had low blood flow, but no damage, no permanent damage in this area of the brain. We were able to restore blood flow in the very first days of stroke, in the second day um, after his stroke, after we had restored blood flow, these, area, these uh, functions recovered. Now, what about subacute recovery? Well, this really depends on reorganization of structure function relationships. So you heard a lot about neuroplasticity and uh, long-term potentiation. Uh, we think that reorganization of structure function relationships really depends on neuroplasticity, that parts of the brain that aren't used to doing these tasks can take over these um, new functions. So we found in um, patients acutely, this is a, these are patients, two patients who had tiny little lesions, one in the thalamus of the brain, which is, we sometimes think of the gate as the gateway to the cortex. Um, so the patient doesn't have any damage to the cortex, but has a tiny lesion here, um, does not have low blood flow to the cortex, but the cortex is not activated normally. So we don't see any activation of the left cortex during a naming task. Um, this patient has a tiny little lesion here, shown in white, in the white matter tracts from the thalamus to the cortex, and again does not show the normal uh, left cortical activation during a naming task. Um, and a few weeks later, these patients show a change in the activation during the same picture naming task. So this patient now shows normal left left dominant activation during the picture naming task. He's changed activation, so he's gone from a mostly right hemisphere activation to a mostly left hemisphere activation when he improved in picture naming. And this patient also showed, uh, he showed some left hemisphere activation in the mostly occipital cortex during a picture naming task, but he showed increased left hemisphere activation as he recovered um, 
And this just shows, this is something called the laterality index, which is not a very uh, uh, important index, except that it just shows the difference. It just quantifies what I just showed you. The, when the bars go down, it shows that most of the activation is in the right hemisphere. When the bars go up, it shows most of the activation is in the left hemisphere. You can see for both patients, at three days, it was mostly right hemisphere activation. At uh, eight weeks, it was mostly uh, left hemisphere activation in both cases. Now, reorganization of structure function relationships also depends on, on uh, individual factors. So these patients have very similar strokes. These are two women. This one's younger, um, and this one uh, is uh, older, but she has a little more education. She has a slightly larger stroke, but in the same area, in Broca's area. This person has a more severe or this patient has a more severe aphasia, though. Um, and what I'll show you is that they had different patterns of recovery. At the very first day of stroke in a spelling task, this person, it's not very important that this person shows more activation. The amount of activation that you show may have more to do with how much coffee you had in the morning, how much you're trying, and so on. But what we see is they both show bilateral activation, and in this case, um, she the patient does show some activation in the left hemisphere language areas, right around the lesion in Broca's area. She's really trying to use the normal uh, language cortex for the task and does show a lot of uh, normal language network activation in addition to some right hemisphere activation, whereas this patient shows just some sort of random activation during the spelling task. And these are only activation during their, their correct responses. And what we see is completely opposite patterns of activation during this task at the acute stage. And these are only significant areas of activation. So the patient uh, who had more education and was doing a little bit better showed uh, bilateral activation, but, but really left lateralized activation in, the, in more language areas. Um, I'm going to skip this one and just talk a little bit about chronic recovery. And one large study showed that um, looked at a couple of variables that, that um, influenced chronic recovery and found that chronic recovery really depended um, on the time since stroke more than the volume of lesion age or the sex of the person or handedness or, or even the site of lesion. And this was recently published. But one thing they didn't look at was education or antidepressant use. And so we looked, we had um, hypothesized that these might be two important variables. And when we looked at these variables in a somewhat smaller stroke, uh, a smaller study, uh, we found that these were, in fact, very important variables, that education, as well as lesion size um, and antidepressant use, were all independent um, variables that influenced um, the recovery or the, the degree of recovery of language. Um, education actually had the highest influence. And that's surprising because the tests that we use to measure language don't require more than a uh, grade school education. And our, our um, average education was uh, 14 years of education. So most of these people had um, a college education or at least a high school education. And so it's, it's not really education itself, but this is probably a marker for either healthy brain, cognitive reserve, something about education that tells us that the person is going to recover better. Um, and the antidepressant use, you'll hear more about um, antidepressants are do influence. Um, most of these patients were on selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. You've just heard about how serotonin can affect neuroplasticity, and you'll hear more about how ser uh, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors may influence stroke recovery. Um, so most, uh, what about differences in, in, in activation patterns? Most studies show that patients who recover better are those who show more left hemisphere activation during language. You just you heard about that in the Sauer study, but it may depend on the task. Most studies have really only looked at auditory comprehension and speech production, assuming that these are the most important language functions. And I'm just going to say this since we're at a writer's workshop. Um, we recently s surveyed 33 stroke survivors and their caregivers to identify the sequel of stroke that had the greatest impact on the quality of life. And the most important or most common residual impairment 
reported by both stroke survivors and their caregivers um, that had the greatest impact on their quality of life was, um, which was reported in 71% of stroke survivors and their caregivers, was actually spelling and writing. So I thought for a writer's workshop, you all would appreciate it. This is the one that concerned them the most. Um, and it turns out it's the one thing that the, the right hemisphere can't recover very well. So this is a patient you saw at the beginning who's had a huge stroke, and he's recovered actually amazingly well. He has no word comprehension deficit, no naming difficulty or, or reading difficulty, no speech articulation impairment, but he did have a s severe spelling impairment um, and only maybe some mild hesitancy in speech. And when we looked at language, even in reading, he's used mostly right, his right hemisphere. So some patients who recover incredibly well use, most, use their right hemisphere for, uh, for language. So it's not always true that, those, that patients use mostly their left hemisphere if they recover well. However, remember, he did not recover spelling well. Now, he's recently re, um, received some rehabilitation for spelling, and now he's beginning to use his left hemisphere, what's left of it. So the tiny areas of the left hemisphere he has left have taken over spelling. So in conclusion, language network is similar across healthy individuals, across language tasks, includes Broca's area and Wernicke's area. Lesions to the individual components of the left language network cause relatively predictable, distinct language deficits. The brain adapts um, to these, de these lesions in different ways, um, and it really depends on the type of, uh, not only the size and the side of the stroke, the time post onset, individual factors, including the language task, medications that affect neuroplasticity, and even rehabilitation. And so I just want to point out, this has taken the, uh, always, science always takes a team, and this is my team, and it always takes funding, and I'm appreciati appreciative of the funding from NIH. Thank you.